So two weeks ago, we had a standalone sermon that's turned into a two-part sermon. Yay. Nobody cares. All right. We talked about not letting our circumstances determine our attitude. And today's going to be part two of that message with a similar message, but we're going to take one part of part one and go deeper into it, okay? I did warn y'all last week that I thought, or two weeks ago when we were here, that I thought this would evolve into two messages. So I'm going to go ahead and give you the title of this message. So last week was, Don't Let Your Circumstances Determine Your Attitude, or Do We Let Our Circumstances Determine Our Attitude? This week is, Can You Have a Good Attitude When Bad Things Are Happening? Can You Have a Good Attitude When Bad Things Are Happening During Bad Times? It doesn't matter if we're talking about your personal life, if we're talking about the nation, if we're talking about the world. Can you have a good attitude when bad things are happening? How many of you just naturally have a good attitude when bad things are happening? We got, a, we got two and a half. Chris tried to raise his hand, but he knew if he raised it too high, Gina would pull it back down. I'm sorry, I'm not going to pick on you anymore this morning. And I'm not talking about a fake attitude. I want to be clear. I'm not talking about faking it till you make it, pretending everything's okay. I'm talking about having a faith-based, God-centered, grounded attitude when good or bad things happen. Whether it's personal, whether it's in our country, whether it's in our world, and we're going to talk about all three of those today. And I'm not saying that you can't not have sadness. See, when we say, can you have a good attitude, everybody assumes I'm saying you can't be sad or you can't mourn. Well, you should go read the book I wrote that tells you you get blessed when you do things like be mourning. So that is not what I'm saying. I'm not saying you can't have sadness. You can have a great attitude and still be mourning. I'm mourning the death of someone, but my good attitude is I trust God that it was his timing and he has a plan. You understand what I'm saying? Bad things can happen. We can be sad. We can mourn. We don't always have to be happy to say, I have a good attitude. But I'm trying to make sure that our attitude is based on our faith. It's based on God's promises, and that's what we talked about a lot two weeks ago. So I want to recap from two weeks ago because some of y'all weren't here, and you may or may not have, have listened to it. If you did, it's still been two weeks. So we're going to recap it, not completely, but our teaching two weeks ago was out of the book of Leviticus and the book of Numbers, two books that we normally call very boring and we don't want to read, right? Everybody shook their head yes. So the recap is the Israelites or the Hebrew people had been rescued out of Egypt. They had spent two years approximately in the wilderness. God rescues them. I'm sorry, God had rescued them from Egypt. Now they're two years in the wilderness. God had provided for them. God gave a promise in Leviticus 20, 24 to his people. He promised that he would, they would possess a land he was giving to them, what we call the promised land, and it would be a land flowing with milk and honey. And he said, I will set you apart. You will be a holy people. You will be set apart in that land. Then he sent out 12 men. This is where we went two weeks ago. He sent out 12 men to spy or scope out the land. That was Numbers 13. 12 went. And remember, all 12 had experienced all the miracles. They'd only been in the, in the wilderness two years. So it's not like Joshua and Caleb were born after they saw all the miracles. All 12 men had experienced everything the same. They'd experienced the miracles of the Red Sea being parted. They'd experienced the miracles of having food and water every day supernaturally. And all 12 of them went to that new promised land for 40 days. They saw with their own eyes that what was in that promised land was exactly what God had promised. They brought back a grape cluster. Anybody remember how big it was? So big it took two people to carry it. So God had made a promise. All 12 men had seen that the promise was real. All 12 men had miraculous, seen the same miracles, the miraculous things God had done to get them to that point. But when they came back, only two of the 12, Joshua and Caleb, I gave you the wrong percentage two weeks ago. It's 17%. Two people out of 12, 17% 
Joshua and Caleb believed God's promise. They all saw God's promise. It's true. But when they came back, only two believed it. While the other ten said, it, it can't, we can't possibly take these people. We see that your promise is true. We see us the land of milk and honey. We see the grapes and the figs and all this stuff we brought back. But we can't possibly take these people. Two said, this place is fantastic. As Pete would say. It's everything God promised it would be. Let's go take it. And 10 said, we're all going to die if we try to go take it. So I'm going to call those 10 the negative Nancys. And we saw that in Scripture that the 10 negative Nancys even acknowledged the promise. It's not like they saw the promise and then they came home and said, nope, it's not there. They acknowledge it. It's in Scripture. In Numbers 13, verse 27, they told Moses, we entered the land you sent us to explore. And it is indeed a bountiful country, a land flowing with milk and honey, just like God promised. Here's the kind of fruit it produces. It's what you promised, Lord. Their own words were, it's what you promised, Lord. But see, it's the next verse that changed their destinies forever when they said, but. But the people living there are powerful and their towns are large and fortified. We even saw giants living there. See, these, all 12 go, two come back so we can take the land. The other 10 say, I see that the promise of God is true, but. So my question to all of us, this should be a self-reflection question and just for people we meet. Have we ever met somebody that says they believe the promises of God, but their actions show totally different? There's lots of people out there that proclaim the promises of God. And then we're, 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 bewildered when they don't live it out and when we see something opposite. But there is a reality that was happening 3,400 years ago that's still happening today that people will read God's Word. They will say, I believe in the promises of God, but I ain't going back there because I'll die if I do. Two men believed and were willing to go. Ten believed said they believed, but if you watch their actions and their words, they proved they did not believe. So I heard a pastor once say, listen to a person talk. I'm going to quote his quote, and then I'm going to add to it. He says, listen to a person talk, and they'll tell you how big their God is. I'm going to add to that. They'll tell you how big or little their God is. Listen to a person talk, and they'll tell you how big their God is. Caleb and Joshua saw the promise. They believed the promise. They're willing to risk everything because they believed the promise. The other ten saw the promise, said they believed in the promise. And they weren't just quick to quit themselves. They were really quick to draw, draw a lot of other people with them. And that's kind of where I want to spend a little bit of time. I'm covering this again because I wonder how much of this parallels the church in America today. 17% believe the promises and act on them. Trust God fully. While 83% maybe say they believe only to prove by their actions they don't. Is this another statistic that we're being given? I know I'm drawing something out of that. And if that percentage sounds harsh, let me remind you, Peyton referenced it earlier, when Jesus is talking to the seven churches in Revelation, he only tells two of them good job. Seven, five of the seven get chastised by Jesus for what they're not doing right. Two are praised. That's 29% are praised. 71% are chastised. Don't worry, there's not going to be a test later with all these numbers. I'm just trying to make the point that 17% is a really small number of people who believe the promises and try to do them, and 29% is a really small number for the churches that are actually doing what Jesus wants. By the way, those two churches that got praised weren't doing exactly the same thing. They had different strengths. Jesus didn't expect all seven churches to be the same. In fact, some of the five, he said, you're doing some good things. And if you compare those lists, which we did a year or so ago, there's lots of good things they were doing, but they weren't doing what he wanted. And when you look at the good things being done, there was, there was diversity within those churches of what they did. 
So it's not Jesus saying you all got to do the exact same thing, and that's what we get caught up in sometimes. This church didn't do what I want, so I don't like them. This denomination didn't do what I want, so I don't like them. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about being people being totally devoted to Jesus with everything they have. Then we got the parable of the ten bridesmaids. They all want to get into the wedding feast, and that represents us as Jesus believers waiting on Jesus to come back and get us to take us to the wedding feast, and only half of them get in. All of them think they're getting in. Half of them get in. So is the Father, through his word, if I put all these numbers together, is he saying only 50% of Christians, people who say they're Christ followers, really believe? Is he saying that only 29% of churches that think they're doing it right are actually glorifying Jesus? Is he saying that only 17% of Jesus' followers actually believe that the promises of God are true? This is why it matters what we believe, what we say, what we do, who we hang out with. All of this matters. We actually have to believe the promises of God and act on the promises of God. Even when it doesn't look like they're happening in the time frame or the way that we think they should. So is our perspective, is our attitude based on what we see? Or is it based on what we believe? Is it based on what we see in real time, or is it based on what we believe from what we know from Scripture or what we're learning from Scripture? It's not our words that show our faith. It's our actions. Our words can help start it, but it's our actions that show our faith. Joshua and Caleb saw the same thing as the other 12, but they were criticized, and then they were threatened by death. It's not enough that, no, 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 we can't go there. They'll kill us. We're going to kill you too for even trying to take us there. So they're believing in the promises of God, and they get threatened by death. So I want you to think about that. Joshua and Caleb Caleb believed, and their reward is twofold. They get to wander in the desert for another 38 years with everyone else because of everyone else's unbelief, and the whole group's trying to kill them. Sometimes that's what you get when you follow the promises of God and actually believe in them. I want to stand up here and give you a prosperity gospel of how easy your life's going to be, but then I read stories like this. These two men believed, and they had equal punishment of everyone else, 38 more years in the wilderness. That was never the design. The design was to go on into the promised land, but because of their unbelief, they were 38 more years because a whole generation had to die off. And the whole group wanted to kill them. Because sometimes it's just easier to do away with people that actually believe in the promises of God instead of changing our lives to match those promises. But there was an interesting thing that I mentioned two weeks ago in that scripture, and I want to key on it a little bit. Numbers 13, verses 30 through 33, but Caleb tried to quiet the people as they stood before Moses. So remember, not only do they want to kill Caleb and Joshua, they're trying to say, we need a whole new leader. Moses isn't cutting it. Caleb says, let's go at once to take the land. Remember I said that theme of I've seen too much? I can't go back. This is where it comes from. Caleb said, I've seen too much. Let's go take it at once. We can do it. We can certainly conquer it. Verse 31, but the other men who had explored the land with him disagreed. We can't go up against them, so that's unbelief. They don't believe in the promises. They said they're stronger than we are, so they spread this bad report. So now they're spreading rumors. They spread this bad report about the land among the Israelites. The land we traveled through and explored will devour anyone who goes to live there. And all the people we saw were huge. We even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. Next to them we felt like grasshoppers, and that's what they thought too. So I brought that up last week, two weeks ago. That's what they thought too. But I really want to hammer in on this because there are conversations going on in our lives that never happened. You guys can probably give me examples in your own lives with your families, with your friends, with ex-churches, whatever, ex-spouses, I don't know. There are conversations being talked about that just never happened. And that's what's happening here. They started spreading a rumor, we're going to die if we go there, they're going to devour us, we're like grasshoppers, and that's what they thought too. 
It is never said in Scripture that those people said that, but that's what the rumor turned into. There are conversations going on around you, around me, around all of us at some level, at some points, where 10 people are starting stuff. I'm using that as a figurative thing. 10 people will make up accusations to discredit you because you're willing to stand up for God. And I think one of the biggest things, if I think back over the 11 years that I've been blessed to be in church leadership, I've watched this happen to pastors. The pastor's great. He's awesome. He's on a pedestal. Oh, he challenged me. Did you hear this about him? I heard he's doing this. And he said this, and I don't think that's really biblical. And all they do is start a little rumor, and it starts discrediting. I've seen it happen to pastors. I've seen it happen to church attendees. I've seen it happen to some of y'all in here. I've seen it happen to me. I've seen it happen to my family. There is a fact that when someone believes in the promises of God and they stand up for the promises of God, there's some people that are going to be challenged. They're not going to want to be challenged. They're not going to want to rely on their faith. They're not going to want to make the changes they need to make, and so they'll just start making up conversations that never happened. And I don't think they purposely do it. I'm talking about when somebody... He's got this subconscious thought of, I can't do what they're asking me to do, and I'm not going to go there. That's too painful. And then the next thing you know, there's just little snippets of things going around. It should be no surprise to us because this is exactly what was going on here in that boring little book of Numbers. The ten saw miracles. They saw the promises were true. They came back after 40 days alive and unharmed. Nothing happened to them. That's a key point. But they started telling everybody what the enemy was thinking when the enemy never spoke. I was talking to a couple yesterday in counseling. And I was talking about the conversations that we have in our own heads that don't happen. What's that? (laughs) Any of y'all ever have a conversation in your own head about what someone thinks or says and, and it never happened? Do you know why it came up in counseling? Because I told them about an example where I did it yesterday morning. Yes, it has nothing to do with any of y'all, okay? Just for the record. We're not living out one of these moments where I'm talking about you in the sermon. Okay, she didn't see Monica's shirt. She got me. We're not talking out, be careful, or you'll end up in my sermon. This is not about none of y'all. This is about landscaping. I got in my mind they're not going to like what I've done. That's ultimately rejection talking, by the way. But I'm by myself. No one's there. And within an hour, I was ready to tell them all the bad things about them I didn't like. They did nothing to me. They said nothing. Then the lady showed up. And she said, it's unbelievable to me how great a work you've done. Why did that come up? Because the couple said, let us tell you what happened this morning right before counseling. Can you help us with this? And it was a scenario where they both thought the other one was thinking something that wasn't being thought. And when they both verbalized it, then they got in a fight because we weren't even thinking about that to begin with. And I was like, hey, I did it this morning. (laughs) Don't feel too bad. In fact, I did it twice yesterday. There's a reality. Can we be honest with ourselves that we do it? Every one of us does it. I get thoughts in my head about what you're thinking or somebody else is thinking or someone who's paying me is thinking, maybe what your boss is thinking, what your child is thinking. And that's one problem. But we're talking here about when you verbalize it out. Because I could have called Wendy and said, I'm frustrated. Let me tell you what's in my brain. And now she hasn't met this person and she's ready to go off on them. Do you see what I'm saying? Sometimes we get the thoughts in our heads, but sometimes we take it a step further and we have the conversation with someone else. Now it's a rumor. Now it's being spread. Now it's, quote, a fact. It never, ever happened. Do you understand why I wanted to come back to this point? Thank you, Parker. It shouldn't be a surprise to us, though. It's happening here in Scripture.
when that thought escapes our head and it comes out on this evil little tongue that James warned us about. Remember? Remember what James said about the tongue? Starts a forest fire, steers a ship. It becomes a story about another person, and we start to discredit that person and create a villain when they've done nothing wrong. Stories, opinions, facts start emerging. That 3,400 years ago, approximately. Because sometimes the, one that be- the ones that believe the most in the promises of God, the ones that are ready to act the most, are the ones that get talked about the most. Because we live in a society that it is just easier to shoot the messenger and deal with that than to deal with the message. Right? I don't like your message, so I'll discredit you instead of actually trying to do life change. Because life change is hard. So I'll discredit you. That's, what we, that's our society. Whether we're talking about Bible stuff or not, that's our society right now. We start having conversations in our heads <laughs> and to other people about things that's never happened. And we're just like the ten spies. So I ask before, are you like Joshua and Caleb or are you like the ten spies? And it's really quick to go, I'm Joshua and Caleb, but i got to admit, sometimes I'm a little both. They said that's what they thought too when nothing was ever said. The conversation never happened, but all it took was ten people to say it did to make the whole nation suffer for 38 more years. And it almost cost two men their lives. I think this is a huge church issue for churches today. And I think we've all experienced it, and that's why I want to hammer on this. Too many conversations are taking place as fact that never happened. And Satan knew if I can make this happen, it'll keep a whole generation from experiencing the promised land. And I think he knows now if I can make this happen, it can destroy the whole purpose of a church. It can keep a church from accomplishing what they're supposed to. It can destroy a family. It can destroy a business. It can destroy individuals. That's Satan's goal. Kill, steal, destroy. His tactics haven't changed. It just looks different now. But if we can tie it back to that, it's encouragement for us not to go there. So again, two weeks ago, I said, are you Joshua and Caleb, or are you the other ten that didn't believe? And I asked a lot of other questions. But today I'm going to ask, are you the one living out your faith in God for all people to see? Or are you the one having conversations behind closed doors that have never taken place? Are you both? God gives us truth in his word, and he asks for us to have faith. And those two things together determine our perspective and our attitude on everything. Sorry, I don't have this to give you on a piece of paper, but this is a simple formula. The truth, which is God's Word, plus our faith determines how we see things. The truth of God's Word plus our faith determines our perspective. The truth of God's Word plus our faith determines our attitude. I didn't say you're not going to have a bad attitude every now and then. I'm talking about how to get out of it sometimes. So again, two weeks ago, the title was Don't Let Your Circumstances Determine Your Attitude. And I was trying to give you encouragement about Joshua and Caleb saying, I've seen too much. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go take them. It's a promise from God. This week, I'm shifting it a little bit to can you have a good attitude during a bad time? And I'm going to give you some scriptural examples later of people who did let or did not let their circumstances determine their attitude. Or they were able to have a good attitude during bad times, whichever one you want to say. We take the truth of God, and by the way, who, what's the truth from God? The truth that sets you what? Thank you. The truth of God the truth that sets you free, you add your faith into it. Now you add some actions on top of that faith, and those things should determine your attitude. That's your formula. The truth, your actions, your faith, determine your attitude. They should determine your attitude. Joshua and Caleb never changed their attitude, never changed their perspective. Everybody wants to kill them. They remain faithful. And yes, they had to suffer for 38 years, but they're the only two that got to see the promised land. See, they were rewarded. So I said two weeks ago, 
you might have the faith in God's promises to go to the promised land. But because of everyone else's actions around you, not necessarily in this room, right? Because we're all good. You may not get to see the promised land for 38 more years because of their actions. But the, here's the good news. The silver lining, they still got to see the promised land. But they were the only two. The whole generation had to die off. They're the only two that got rewarded to see the promised land because their faith never wavered in God's promises. They held true. They were rewarded. So I don't really care. I do care. But I don't care what things look like around your personal life right now. I care as a person who loves you and wants to pray for you. I'm talking about in terms of your attitude and your rewards from God. I don't really care how bad things are in your personal life. I don't really care how bad our nation is. I don't really care how, how bad the world is. We are supposed to believe God's promises and act on our faith no matter what's going on around us. Is everybody clear on that? So I'm going to talk about the nation and the world for a minute. I'm going to give you two scriptural examples, and then we're out of here. What would you say? In the past month or so in our nation, because I, I don't think i got to talk about your personal lives, right? You all know your personal lives. You all know what's going on with your families. Does anybody have a normal family in here? Don't raise your hands. I mean, I do, because mine will probably watch, so I need to at least say they're normal, right? Let's go to our nation. In the past month or so, someone tried to assassinate a man because he's willing to go against the norm. Parker said, or he's the Antichrist. There's an argument for that. <laughs> Y'all want to go there next Sunday? Nobody wants to talk about Trump potentially being the Antichrist. Well, stick your heads back in the sand. I'll let you know when it happens. Okay. In the past month or so, Donald Trump, they tried to assassinate him. Who's they? We don't know. We won't get into that. Why? Because he's trying to go against the norm. Sounds a lot like Numbers 13 to me. Oh, but I'm not putting him on a pedestal with Josh and Caleb. I want to be clear about that, okay? Because I don't think he is. I'm just talking about a crazy thing that happened in our world. Just in the last month, in our nation. Not the world, our nation. Then... We as a country installed a presidential candidate without voting. By definition, that goes against democracy while that party says we're trying to save democracy. Hypocritical a little? Maybe, yes. Then that person picked a VP running mate that says they went to war, but they never went to war. It's called stolen valor. He's a known liar. As governor of Minnesota, this is not political, by the way. I'm just trying to give you some things that are going on in our nation. I promise it's not political. You're going to hear that in just a second because I think they're both sides are evil. I'll go ahead and give you the, the cut to the chase. But this vice presidential guy created a safe place in his state for pedophilia. He's a school teacher. And he created a safe place for children to come get sex changes against their parents' wishes. And he created a safe place for babies to be aborted up till and after birth. The stat that we heard was five babies a year die in the state of Minnesota after birth due to abortion. That is murder after birth. There are many states, New York, I can't remember, there are five or six states that allow abortion after birth. California, New York, Minnesota, where else? Colorado, I don't know them all. I'm just going off what everybody's telling me. So if I'm wrong, it's their fault, not mine, okay? Oh, yeah, more rides and burns downs than anybody else. And, and, you know, here's the deal. In 2020, a man died in Minnesota, and the world went nuts over it. But nobody cared about the five babies that got killed. Movements were started out of one man dying who was high as a kite. But we don't care that five babies died that same year after birth by abortion. This is, this is our nation. All right, you think I'm anti-Democrat and pro-Republican, so let's go to the other side. 
I'm just going to give you an easy one for those of you out there, and I don't know that any of y'all are here or like that, but to think Trump is the second coming of the Messiah. Peter tells us in Scripture, and this is a very personal Scripture to me, don't repay evil with evil or with an insult, pay, repay an insult with a blessing. Do you hear him get up and repay insults with blessings? <laughs> so at a minimum, if he's a good person, he doesn't follow that part of Scripture. He re replies insults with 47 insults. That's his business. He can deal with that with the Lord. My point is I'm not trying to alienate anybody through politics or have a political conversation. I'm trying to point out the elephant in the room that our nation is in trouble spiritually. And there ain't no elected official getting us out of it. I've heard two different people, an elected official and a pastor in the past month, say we can't vote our way out of this problem. We can't uh, legislate our way out of this problem because it's a heart issue. America is in trouble. Neither side is living out biblical principles that our country was founded on. By the way, killing babies has become so much of a deciding issue in our country that now mo a lot of the Republican Party who has traditionally stood against it is starting to change the position. Because in 2022, when there was supposed to be this Republican landslide, it didn't happen because of the issue of abortion. And so they saw that instead of standing firm on a biblical principle of not killing a baby, they said we will change and we'll change ever so slightly to try to not make people mad, but to be able to say we're more on this side so we can win elections. That's evil. So if you believe in America and that's where your faith is, or in red versus blue, I heard someone say today they're just different color wings of the same bird. Red wing, blue wing, still the same evil bird. If you believe in Trump or Kamala, <laughs> your attitude is about to be severely affected. But if your belief is in the promises of God, that by the way, don't mention America in end times prophecy, then you can rest in your faith of knowing that God still has all of this in his control as the United States of America goes downward. I don't want our country to go under. That would be super uncomfortable. I don't want to even think about it. But it's not an end time scripture, and we look like we're getting closer to end times every day. All right, what about the world? Thank you, Parker. You keep reminding me I will talk longer. What about the world? Iran, we covered it earlier. They vowed to retaliate against Israel this coming Tuesday. War from all seven, pro or them plus six proxies, that's a seven-front war. It could, it could literally ignite World War III in two days. And most people didn't even know it was happening until we showed up and talked about it this morning. But if your belief and your faith is in God's promises, you see that this could be and possibly is Psalm 83 war about to happen in front of your eyes. Followed by or preceded by the Jeremiah 49 war. Nobody remembers that, do they? Jeremiah 49 war still has to happen where a portion of Iran is totally obliterated. Well, hey, here's a newsflash, guys. Israel is known for preemptive strikes, and their people are calling for one right now. So there is a possibility they could strike Iran, then the Psalm 83 war, and guess what that leads to? Russia and Turkey come in, and now we got Ezekiel 38. See, my point is, you can get, oh, it's World War III about to happen, or you can say, hey, we're living out the promises of God, and we got some biblical things happening right in front of our eyes. We get to see it. Where's our perspective? Where's our attitude? Is it based in the promises of God or in what we're watching happen in our nation and our world? Do you get my point? Your personal life may stink. Our nation stinks. Our world stinks. But can you still have a good attitude to Jesus no matter what happens with those things? Joshua and Caleb persevered 38 years for a promise to be fulfilled but they still had to fight the giants when they got there. There's nothing in God's word that tells us it's going to be easy. Even the two that persevered and got rewarded still had to fight when they got there. And maybe you and I got to persevere for the next 38 years.
but it'll be worth it for the promises that will be fulfilled. And I'm going to end with two quick scripture stories, Parker, so we'll be somewhat on a timeline. Wendy told me yesterday I had to be done by 1. Then she said today 12, and then it was before 12. She's shaking her head no. So the way I look at it, I'm still going to be about 45 minutes early. Before I encourage you, though, there's a reality. We keep talking about the promises of God. Do you realize that not all the promises of God are good promises? The promises of God can fall into a good category and a bad category. Jesus said, you're going to be killed for believing in me. That's a promise. The good promise is you spend eternity with him. The bad promise is it's going to suck for a little while while you're here on earth. He said it himself. How many times have we promised that we would suffer for our belief in Jesus? by the apostles. We watch them suffer. How many times were we encouraged to persevere to the end? So we can't get caught up that every promise about God is a fluffy good thing. The promises of the future are pretty incredible. You know, spending eternity with our Father in a perfect place. That, that's a cool promise. What you're going to go through between now and then is going to be good and bad. It's going to be a roller coaster. Two stories. I can give you more. But for the sake of time, I'll give you two. Psalm 46. Anybody know who wrote Psalm 46? The descendants of Korah. Anybody remember who Korah was from about three, four weeks ago? He rebelled against Moses, and his whole family was swallowed up in the earth. But he had descendants, and they wrote this psalm, and it's pretty cool. God is our refuge and strength. That's a promise. Always ready to help in times of trouble. That's a promise. So we will not fear when earthquakes come and the mountains crumble into the sea. Let the oceans roar and foam. Let the mountains tremble as the waters surge. A river brings joy to the city of our God, the sacred home of the Most High. God dwells in that city and it cannot be destroyed. That's a promise. Whatever happens this week, Jerusalem cannot be destroyed. That is a promise. From the very break of day, God will protect it. The nations are in chaos. Hello? <laughs> and their kingdoms crumble. God's voice thunders and the earth melts. The Lord of heaven's armies is here among us. The God of Israel is our fortress. Come and see. Come see the glorious works of the Lord. See how he brings destruction upon the world. He causes wars to end throughout the world. He breaks the bow and snaps the spear. He burns the shield with fire. And here's a very famous verse. Be still and know that I am God. We all, how many of you got that in your house? We do. Be still and know that I am God. Comes after the descendants of Korah, who was swallowed up in the earth, but his family, some descendants, still believed in the promises of God. Do you get that core, that good news there? Bad things happen, but his descendants still believed enough to write this. This is utter chaos happening, and he says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be honored by every nation. I'll be honored throughout the world. World, The Lord of heaven's armies is here among us. The God of Israel is our fortress. My point is this psalm is written in total chaos. But God is our refuge and strength in the chaos. We won't fear in the chaos because the Lord of heaven's armies is here. In the chaos, be still and know that he is God. When the chaos happens, natural disasters. This week we had a hurricane hit the U.S. twice. Florida, and then back up through South Carolina. Political disasters. We're watching one unfold right in front of our face. Wars. We're watching them all over the place, and they're about to break out more. But what do we do in that time? Be still and know that he is God. He's in control. He still holds the keys. It's still his master plan that we may not understand. Be still and know that he is God. My point is, that's a story of ultimate just chaos, but they still have the right attitude. Does that make sense? Final story, Acts 7. Anybody remember Stephen getting killed? Stephen believes in Jesus. He gets questioned. He witnesses to him. It makes them mad. They kill him. Acts 7, verse 54, the Jewish leaders were infuriated by Stephen's accusations because before they killed him, he chastised them. 
and they shook their fists at him in rage. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed steadily into heaven and saw the glory of God, and he saw Jesus standing in the place of honor at God's right hand. This man knows he's about to die. What does he do? Hey, I see you, Jesus. You want to tell me you can't have that right attitude in a bad spot? Any of y'all face death yet? Anybody? As far as I know, I'm the closest one that had a potential of it. I didn't look up. I squeezed. But that's a different story. I still got work to do. (laughs) And he told them, look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing in the place of honor at God's right hand. You're about to kill me and all I can see is Jesus. That's proof that we can have a good attitude in a bad circumstance. Then they put their hands over their ears and began shouting like, it's like a little kid. I don't want to hear this. They rushed at him. They dragged him out of the city. They began to stone him. His accusers took off their coats and laid them at the feet of a young man named Saul, later named Paul. We talked about him. As they stoned him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He fell to his knees shouting, Lord, don't charge them with this sin. And with that, he died. Can you have a good attitude when bad things are happening to you? When the world is going to heck in a handbasket? When your personal life's going to heck in a handbasket? When the nation's going to heck in a handbasket? I gave you two examples. Be still and know he's God. Stephen is literally dying one of the most painful deaths you could experience by stones being thrown at him. And he chose not only to see Jesus, but he asked Jesus to forgive him. So do you want to be the psalmist? Do you want to be Stephen? you want to be Joshua? you want to be Caleb? Or do you want to be the other side of every one of those stories? And I end with the question, can you have a good attitude when bad things are happening? Yes, yes you can, and yes you should. Father, thank you for these examples in the Bible that show us that we can still have a good attitude when everything is crumbling around us because of your promises that don't change because your word says you were the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. That's a promise, and I stand on that promise. And, Father, you promised a reward for us that persevere. You promised a new heaven and a new earth. You promised eternal life through those that believe and obey Jesus. You made so many good promises, and we stand firm on those promises. But, Father, I'm asking for you to give us the courage, the strength, the faith to stand on your promises. When everyone else is walking away, when everyone else is making fun of us, when everyone else wants to stone us, that we will be still and know that you are still in control. You are still the protector of Jerusalem. You are still the Lord of heaven's armies. You are still going to send your son back, and we're going to watch as every one of the enemies is defeated, as every knee bows and every tongue confesses that your son Jesus is the Messiah. So, Father, thank you, and let this be an encouragement Help us to stop having conversations in our head that never happened. Help us to stop having conversations with others that never happened. And help us to be the remnant that stands strong when everyone else crumbles. In Jesus' name, amen. Quickly, quickly, I'm not going to sing, but uh, interestingly, does anybody know what yesterday's Torah portion was? Devarim. These are the words, the book of Deuteronomy. And what is the first thing Moses talks about? Well, we're in the wilderness, and you guys said we don't want to go into the land. Interesting how it lines up with the sermon today. He recounts it. But here's some interesting details about that journey. He adds a couple extra details in this retelling. Number one, how many men did it take to carry out the grapes from the land? Two, trick question, four. What? The Bible says two. No, the Bible in Hebrew says it took two poles to carry them out. That's an X. It took four. Those grapes were so large, they'd have four men carry them out. It says when they carried out a fig, it took an entire man to carry a fig and a pomegranate. And they walk up and they go, I mean, obviously you can tell by me carrying this gigantic pomegranate that God hates me. Right? What's the first thing they say to Moses? We can take the land, but God hates us. Right? He brought us out of Egypt to kill us here. What does Moses say? 
They were afraid of the giants. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 40, I think. He says, but guess who killed the giants? The Moabites killed the giants. They're not godly by any means. They hire Balaam to come and curse them. They're killing the giants. Because you know what? The unbelievers had more faith than God's people did. And Moses says, you didn't kill the giants because you were afraid and they killed them. Look at what you have. Did God ever give the Moabites this gigantic fruit? See, to us we go, oh my gosh, that's gigantic fruit. Who cares? That's their livelihood back then. Right? That's like them coming out with like one of those trucks that carries gold. A big old truck full of gold and going, well, God didn't give us anything. I mean, we're broke. The Moabites were given nothing. They were formed out of an incestuous relationship between Lot and his daughter. And they still killed the giants. Think about that. There are people today accomplishing more than the believers are because what? We have no faith. What did the disciples say? Hey man, you know, Lord, you sent us out. We try to cast out demons and heal people, but they just weren't listening. And what did Jesus say? Man, that's terrible. Well, okay, we're going to have to spend another year teaching you guys how to get your act straight. He looks at him. Did he say that? No. He looked at him and he said, you have no faith. What did he say? How much faith does it take to move a mountain? A mustard seed. Okay, who knows how big a mustard seed is? Tiny. I'm not literally saying that you're going to walk up and go to Mount LeConte. Now, if you do this, please bring me because that would be so cool. Hey, jump in Fort Loudon and it just... <laughs> My point is, there are mountains or giants in front of you called unbelief, called laziness, things like this. See, we're so focused on it. They had it better than we have it in a way because they had physical giants that they didn't want to go kill. We have spiritual giants. We have no faith. So that's why Satan's not scared of us. And a whole generation died a premature death. Do the math. Everybody in that generation that had to die off was about 25 to 30. And they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. The Bible says a good life's 80 years. They all died premature deaths. Except for two men. Who were those two men? Joshua. What does the Bible say in the book of Numbers about Caleb? It says they went into Israel, and it gives us this little side note. Oh, yeah, and Joshua went to Hebron. Every time the Bible has a sore thumb, it's trying to say something. Hebron was the capital of the giants. But Caleb wanted to go to where Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were buried. He wanted to be able to see them. And he said, I'm willing to risk it. What did Caleb get? He got this huge tract of land. He got to inherit the promised land. What about Joshua? Did you know that Joshua was not his original name? The book of Numbers says that as they were going into the land, Moses stopped them. And he took Hosea, Joshua, and named him Yehoshua, Joshua. He changed his name to the Lord protect Hosea. That's what that means. The Lord is my salvation. So, you're rewarded. Me and Javier talked about this this week. You got a leg up on everybody. You're rewarded and you're punished in kind for what you do. How long were the spies in the land? 40 days. How long did they wander in the wilderness? Anybody hear anything that connects? They got punished in kind, but what did Joshua and Caleb do? No, we can take it. So God gave them these huge tracts of land. Said, you know what? You believed in my promises, so here's my promises. Get my point? Gotta have faith. When God says, do it, do it. We're so concerned, though. So I part with two things. Number one, there's a famous rabbi in Talmud, and he's dying. And his students say, what's the last thing you can teach us? And he looks at them, and he says, I wish you would fear God as much as you fear man. And they said, well, I mean, we hate to argue with you because you're dying. 
but shouldn't we fear God more than we fear what other people are doing or thinking or saying? And he says, you should, but you don't. You fear God less than you fear man. So if you can just fear God as much as you fear man, you'll be good. Okay. In the same way that Moses put God's name, Yah, on Joshua. The book of Numbers says, Aaron, when you say this blessing, you put my name on the people. So since we're on a time schedule today, we're just going to say it. In the same way that Aaron blessed the people of Israel, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his shalom. Amen.